cloud, got it. Um, okay. So, Yale Strom is here with us, and he is a very special person, very accomplished. We're very lucky to have him. And he's an American violinist, composer, filmmaker, writer, photographer, and playwright. Yale is a scholar artist of klezmer culture and history, and the author of four books on Jewish culture in Eastern Europe. He is also the, a professor at San Diego State in Jewish culture. Is that correct? I, re yeah. I read the wrong thing. Yeah, Jewish, <laughs> I read the wrong in the Jewish thing. studies program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he's composed original music for the theater, film, television, and created the new Jewish jazz. He's the founder of an all-star band called Hot Pastrami that we've had a few times at the J and has artists in residence in the Jewish studies program at San Diego State University. He's performed with his band at the JCC, as I said. He performed Souls on Fire with Ladino music, and he performed Jews and Jazz, and also lectures. And we are always thrilled to have him to educate us and perform uh, for us. So thank you, Yale, for uh, coming to visit us on Zoom, and uh, we'll get started now. Great. Thank you, uh, everybody out there. If you're just wondering why this this kind of strange angle, I'm using my tablet, and the and I didn't realize it didn't have a lot of juice left in it, and so I have to have it plugged in. And of course, they give you a cord about that big. So I'm on a chair, and so is my tablet on the chair. So all right, so Yiddish culture, um, something uh, that you just heard from Jerry. I've been doing for many many years. I've written books and done recordings and, and, and plays and photography. Um, so let's just start off. So what creates, what constitutes a, a, a culture? Well, in anthropology, one of the key pillars is language. And Jews, we have many languages, right? We have, you know, of course, the ancient language, of course, Hebrew, but even before Hebrew, we had Aramaic and other types of uh, early Semitic languages. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, history, a little bit of the history of Yiddish, because the language itself helped create this culture. And then, of course, I'll get into a little bit about theater, as well as, of course, I know, you know many of you know me as also knowing a lot about the, the Jewish music, Yiddish music. So um, um, the language of Yiddish, there's a couple theories. Here's, I'm going to give you the the main theory that we believe where it comes from. Um, you have to understand that uh, Yiddish, um, for the most part, we believe, one theory is that Jews had come with the Romans as slaves, also as traitors, to eventually to Europe. And eventually when they settled in the Rhineland region, right? And if you're not good with geography, it's the most um, uh, uh, western part of Germany that borders the eastern part of France, um, right, very close to Strasbourg. It's the Rhine River. In fact, the Rhine divides that part of Germany from France. Um, and so they came there, and um, uh, oh, I see, I just, I mislabeled something here. I thought this looked a little funny here. Okay, yeah, this is too. Um, and, uh, oh no, I'm right. I'm just looking at my notes and getting all mixed up here. So, so one theory is that these um, Jews came there and they of course have their Semitic languages, but when you're in the local area, you're gonna pick up the local language. And the lingua franca of the local re region was various uh, dialects of German. And of course, today, when we speak Yiddish, and someone who even knows German, they say, oh, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. And there are a lot of similarities in terms of vocabulary um, and so forth. Uh, but there are differences. So I want to add is, so when they came to the Rhineland, um, and they were, you know, and then eventually they were pushed eastwards. And that's starting in, so we're, look, we're looking at, let's say, third, fourth century, third, fourth century, second, third, fourth century, Rhineland. And then eventually by the sixth, seventh, eighth centuries, they're starting to be pushed to the, um, to the east. And why pogroms, 
uh, eventually by the 10th century, 11th century crusades, and Jews are fleeing, right? Um, some went south, some went into you know, northern Italy, some go into France, but many uh, go into what we call today Central and Eastern Europe, the Czech lands, Slovakia, and of course Poland, etc. cetera. Um, and so that is one theory about why there's so much German uh, language um, in Yiddish. Now, I want to add that besides the Ger uh, German, um, the other language that is predominant in Yiddish, we forget, is our oldest language, is Hebrew. So there's a lot of Hebrew words in Yiddish. And in fact, if you ever hear um, Orthodox Jews speak Yiddish, whether they're Orthodox, who are Talmud, uh, as we say in Yiddish, you know, they're uh, learned people of the Talmud or the Torah, uh, so they could be Orthodox or they could also be Hasidim, the Kabbalistic Hasidic Jews. Um, they'll use a lot of Torah Hebraic phrases in their Yiddish to express something, what the rabbi said or a saying. And, um, and so it's a very different Yiddish than everyday Yiddish that, for example, that my Boba and Zeta, right? Grandmother and father, grandfather spoke, which was more of a street Yiddish. And so one question you might ask, where did I learn my Yiddish? I learned my Yiddish from, from my Boba. Uh, she thought she was speaking English, but it was really, I guess, English. <laughs> and, um, and also I went to an Orthodox shul as a kid in Detroit, et cetera. And the kids, when I was not in shul, davening Yiddish, davening, praying, um, I was playing with them. And when kids are speaking to you in a foreign language, you don't want to be an outsider, so you pick it up. Um, so that is one theory. And, and also, as they moved eastward, as I just said, right, going to the Slavic lands, you start getting um, the Slavic languages um, in there, particularly Polish and Russian. Um, everyone's hearing me okay? Okay, because I'm seeing some other... Something went out. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure what that is. But, but they can hear me. Okay, there you go. Anyways, yep. I am. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, but there's a um, background noise. Some funny. Yeah, someone, noise. someone, Mr. Schumann. Okay, let me uh, find after that mute, person. Mute person. Okay. Thank so you. anyhow, okay. So so the so the language also Yiddish also took a lot of Slavic words in it as well. So I'm going to get into a little bit about that vocabulary as well. So that's one theory. Some other linguists, um, historians, uh, anthropologists think that the language didn't start in the Rhineland, but it actually started on the Danube in Bavaria, which is, you know, southern um, Germany today. And it started there and followed the Danube. So that means Hungary, Czech land, Slovak lands. And, um, and they think the Jews went there first and went up there. Now, some think, uh, so that's, that's the second theory. So let me just finish that. So, um, and then eventually went west to the Rhineland and then also east to, I told you, to Poland and Lithuania. And the, and the reason they say this is, is because Bavarian German, you hear a lot of, you hear it and it almost sounds uh, quite a bit of Yiddish. In fact, I was, doing some travel in Eastern Austria. So there's Vienna and then cities like Linz, um, Esternach that are east of Vienna, closer to um, uh, Czech Republic. When you hear them speak, I've, I've seen movies, they say, wait a minute, there sounds how the, the pronunciation. So let me just give you a very simple, so the, the word day in English, D-A-Y, right? So Germans, they say Tag, Tag. They would say a good day is a guten Tag. Guten, good, a good day. Guten Tag. Um, are, they, are they not hearing me? Yeah, no? I, I, I can't mute them. Uh, no, no, I'm saying, can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear oh, okay, you. All right, I'll just keep uh, speaking. That's right. So anyhow, um, and but in Yiddish, they say uh, not Tag, but Tog. Tog. And the, the word for wheel, rod. Uh, rad, R-A-D, wheel in German. And, and then they would say Rod. And so it's the D and the same in Bavarian German. So I know I'm getting technical, but real quick, meaning 
the Bavarian German is closer to the Yiddish that we speak today. So that's why some philologists, anthropologists think perhaps it didn't start in the Rhineland, it started in Bavaria. And then there's one last um, theory, not believed by many, but it's an interesting theory. And I don't know if any of you ever read the book called The Thirteenth Tribe. Um, it was written in way, way back 1976 by Arthur Kessler. And his hypothesis was that, this, that, that the Jews were not even Semitic, but actually were descended from the Turkish Khazars. Remember, Khazaria, where the kingdom decided en masse to convert to Judaism. And they did that around the, you know, seven, eight hundreds. And he says that perhaps that these people, when they went westwards into the Polish Slavic lands, mixed with other people, and they helped create um, a Slavic um, Yiddish that eventually became more Germanic as they went all the way into Germany. Anyhow, that's a lot of history for you, I realize. The main thing to remember, very simple. Sounds like German, a lot of German in it. Hebrew, lots of Hebrew in it. And when you know, and when we're gonna use Hebrew, here's something about Yiddish culture. Hebrew words, so what was our culture around? What was daily life? Daily life was around Torah, right? was around religion, was around the shul, the synagogue, like we use the word shul, even reformed Jews, even Jews who don't even know Yiddish, they say, I'm going to the shul. They may not even realize it, that's a Yiddish word, right? For synagogue. And so everything that had, everything that was about daily religious life, eating kosher meat, a bar mitzvah, study, Yom Toivim, right? The Jewish holidays, Shabbos, uh, um, anything like that, those words we still use in Hebrew, though with a Yiddish accent. The other words uh, that are just uh, more uh, words dealing with outside of Jewish religious culture, and, and then just uh, um, verbs and adjectives, um, is the German. And of course, then there, as I said, there's the Slavic. And I'll show you real quick, because this shows you when you hear this, you hear the interesting, you see how Jews travel. So. A real Germanic word. I just gave it to gut, right? When one says a good Shabbos, gut. There's nothing Hebrew about that. There's nothing Slavic, right? That is a Indo-European word. Um, and so that is a Germanic word. Good, gut, a good Shabbos. Okay, now I said the word Shabbos. I don't say a good Sabbat. I don't say Sabbat, right? Sobat, I say Shabbos. It's Hebrew, right? And now, what's a what's a Slavic word? Let me give you a, a Yiddish Slavic word. Oh, um, uh, uh, oh, the word shmata. That's a funny one, right? Shmata, shmata rags, right? Leftover. You know, they would say a shmata trager. You ever heard that Yiddish? A shmata trager. It's one who peddles rags. Trager means um, a peddler, a trager. Shmata. That is a. That is from the Polish. Uh, let me let me think of another real quick one. Um, it's probably um, oh here's interesting. The word for uh, frog. Now you know you would say how would I know how to say frog? Well, if you spoke Yiddish every day and you saw a frog, you had to have a word for it, right? Um, the word they use for frog, they don't use the Germanic word. They use the the Slavic word. They use jabe. So anyhow, this mixture, this goulash. And at one time, particularly during, I'm going to bring us all the way up to the Haskalah, right? That's Hebrew, right? Haskalah, the Haskalah in Hebrew, Yiddish, you would say the Haskola, right? We know the word Mishpacha, right? Mishpacha means family in Hebrew. How do you say it in Yiddish? You don't say Mishpacha, what do you say? Mishpucha, right? There's a difference. Mishpucha, right? Mishpacha, Mishpucha, right? Um, and so that you know, and so it's still Hebrew, but there's a different accent on the syllable. That's basically the difference. Yet when the Haskalah comes, the Haskola, the Enlightenment coming in the 18th century, what is that for those who might know? Simply, particularly with Moses Mendelssohn, the grandfather of the great, uh, his grandson Mendelssohn. What was his first name? I'm forgetting now. Um, the the composer. Uh, Moses Mendelssohn, German Jew, 
orthodox, but he saw that perhaps a way to inculcate, get along a little bit better with the Gentile society. We don't use the word Gentile. What do we say? The Yiddish word is what? Goyim, right? You ever heard the word Goyim? Sure you have. But that's actually Hebrew. That's not German or Slavic. If you're just showing you how things mix. And you know, Heath said, we, not that we should assimilate, but we have to acculturate more. I'll give you an example. In our synagogues, maybe we should modernize our melodies, make them more Western sounding. Really, we're saying more church-like. In fact, what did the Haskalah do with the Reform Synagogue? Playing what? The organ, right? Today, you would not, you know, when you think of the organ, we think of a church. And you might not realize it, but up in the, even until the 1960s, very reformed synagogues, very reformed, met on Sunday. Men never wore a yarmulke, and all the music was on the church or uh, church on the shul organ. It's very different. Anyhow, so and one of the ways that Moses Mendelssohn also did, he says, "I'm taking the chumash, right? And you know the word chumash, Hebrew, um, and we and they would use that word chumash, chumash in Yiddish." They're not going to find, they're not, not going to say Finnef Bucher, Finnef Bicher, five books. No, they use the Hebrew word, the Torah. He takes that Torah and he translates it into German. So many Jews who couldn't read Hebrew or understand Hebrew now can read it. And it gathered. And um, why do I say this to you? Because those Jews in the 18th century in Eastern Europe, Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, that region, speaking Yiddish, and he and other reform-minded Jews felt that language sounded like a jargon. You know the, the English word jargon? Jargon, right? J-A-R-J-O. In Yiddish, you say a jargon. Well, when you say a jargon, it's like, what is this? It's not a real language. It's a little this. It's a hodgepodge, right? It's like a, it's a, a sort of a Creole language. It's not, you know, a legitimate language. And so there were German Jews. Now, see, I'm saying this, right? German Jews who said to the East European Jews speaking Yiddish, it's a jargon. Speak German, a high language. Speak French, a high language. What is this? And so um, starting really around that time, 1800s, uh, 18th century, 1700s, we started seeing a divide in Jewish society, particularly among the Germanic Jews, Jews that, um, you know, in Vienna, Prague, uh, Budapest, of course, Berlin, big cities, but cities in Central and more Western, Paris, Strasbourg, Amsterdam, they're speaking their Dutch, French, and German. What, you say, oh, don't you speak the Jewish language, meaning Yiddish? Some knew it, but they didn't want to because they looked at it, it was low, jargon, meaning it was not of high intellect. And they said, we don't want to speak this low language. And so what's happening is you're starting to get schisms in Jewish culture where some Jews look down upon other Jews. Perhaps you've heard of that history, right? Remember the East European Jewish immigrant? coming off the boat between 1881 to 1924. He's from Poland or Lithuania, Slovakia, Romania. And the German Jews are living uptown, speaking German or English. And they look down, right? They, they, many of them looked out upon their noses as the low Jew, the very Orthodox Jew, perhaps the Hasidic Jew, or the Jew that was poor, speaking only Yiddish. What do you mean you don't know German or French? Those are those are languages of great letters and great books and literature. Well, Yiddish, what? Well, it's just show go and forget it. It's nothing. And so you're getting this divide where the German and Western Jew who did know Yiddish five, six, seven hundred years ago are forgetting it, wanting to forget it, leaving it entirely. And the East European Jew, that is their mamoshin. You know that Yiddish word, mamoshin? Mama. Mama, it means mother. And Lashen is the Hebrew word Lashon, which means uh, my tongue, my tongue, mother tongue. 
So you're seeing that divide, that cultural divide. Uh, and, and this is because of, of, of a language. And, and so here you have German Jews. They, you had Jews living uptown Manhattan who would look down upon the Jews who were poor peddlers living in the Lower East Side. Um, for all the reasons that I told you, but particularly, not because they were just very orthodox, but because they spoke this jargon, they called it Yiddish. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit, just real quick, a little about literature. So we have found in the archives, the first Yiddish sentence, meaning printed, because the language is older than what's being printed. Uh, 1272 in Werns, as that's pronounced. It looks like the word worms, but it's pronounced Werns in Germany. And, um, and then a little bit later, there were, they had a book called the Shmuel book. And it was a, a book about Samuel the prophet, but turned into a sort of a medieval romance about knights and so forth and so on. So Yiddish, there was early Yiddish in the medieval ages. Um, something also so interesting about Yiddish and it deals with power, deals with men and women and structure. Women only supposed to do certain jobs, men do certain jobs, right? In the Jewish home, right? Women baking in the kala, men were studying, you know, the fiddler on the roof, the East European sort of shtetl um, uh, stereotype. Well, some stereotypes have some partial truth to them. There were roles for the women, roles for the men. Women did not have to, um, uh, oh, okay. Women did not have to uh, go to Hader as long as the men did. And so they're not learning Hebrew. They're not learning to read and write Hebrew. Uh, some are learning a little Chomish, not much, some Torah, and few are learning Talmud and Gomorrah. Um, so their learning is in the home. And so davening, meaning praying, a sidur, right? A sitter, as we say it in Yiddish, a sidur, as we say it in Hebrew. Um, how are they going to read it? What are they going to read? What are they, how are they going to do it? So what they did is there was a book. I think the earliest one was in um, 1590s, so late 16th century. And they created a book called the Tsena Arena, Tsena Arena, basically a homish filled with stories, homiletic stories, biblical stories, as well as the homish, the chemish, uh, translated into Yiddish. And the women would read this in the, in the, in the Vibers uh, section, in the women's section, right? Because men and women are sitting separately after the age of 13 onwards. And so these books, uh, were printed for the women and not very common today to find one. You can, I was lucky to find one when I was traveling in Eastern Europe in the 1980s and it was going to be buried. Uh, you know, there was no use for it. And luckily the gentleman let me, let me have it. Um, so what's interesting though, is why I mentioned that because, because the separation of men and women created the need for some Yiddish literature for the women, right? Because, um, and even if they couldn't read the Yiddish, there was usually one who could, um, and often that person in Yiddish was called the Zogerker, means the sayer, the teller, the Zoger, the Zogen, the Zogerker. And that would be a more learned woman who could read the Senarena, these Yiddish parables, these Yiddish stories, up in the women's section on Shabbos during the davening, during the davening. So that's helping create a, a literature. Of course, what, el what helps define Yiddish is the language, it's also the literature. Um, and we consider the, um, the father of, of uh, Yiddish literature, his name was Shalom, Shalom Yankov Abramovich, or Mendele Mochosephorim. Mendele Mochosephorim, his pseudonym. Mendele the book peddler. And so he, then along with Ayo Peretz, who was a great poet and essayist, um, helped create some of the early uh, uh, Yiddish literature of a higher standard starting in the uh, mid-19th century. And of course, the father of Yiddish theater that really took it a, a, a complete other step was who? Shalom Aleichem. 
And if you, you should know that name, right? That, um, and, um, and none other than famous for Tevya the Milk uh, Tevya the Milkman, or as uh, popular culture knows it, um, Fiddler on the Roof, right? And so why do I mention those three authors? And there are many others, poets and writers, because now literature, it is a high literature. There's great stories and short stories and poetry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another major uh, advancement about Yiddish culture was in 1908. This is very well known in Chernovitz. You might've heard that city in Chernovitz. Yes, Felix, thank you. It was Felix Mendelssohn. Um, in Chernovitz, Chernovitz was today in Bukovina in the Ukraine, once was part of Romania. Um, still some Jews living there, a couple thousand Jews. In 1908, they decided to have a Yiddish conference. It was the first Yiddish conference. And why do I tell you this? Because all the high, all the intellectual professors and linguists and doctors of sciences and so forth, they're discussing what, wh where Yiddish should go. They're also, and they're talking about it in a secular way now, not a religious way. So they decided that Yiddish should become the national language of the, uh, of the, of East European Jews should be our language. We don't look at it as a jargon. It's it's it it it, it it's a language like any like English, like French, and uh, and can be and, and be considered. So they they wanted to establish Yiddish schools, which they did, so students could learn in Yiddish um, all their subjects. Um, they wanted to standardize the spelling of the Yiddish because different. There wasn't standardized, so people were spelling words differently, um, as uh, the grammar and so forth. So this was a very big period, and um, eventually, um, this the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture becomes part of the cornerstone of what is the the fulcrum of Yiddish culture today in the world. If you do any kind of research in Yiddish, any language, food. Um, history, anything to do with East European Jewish culture. And what is that place? That is the Yiddish, Yiddish Wissenschaft Institute, the YIVO Institute, YIVO, Y-I-V-O. Started in 1925 in Vilna, right? Mm. We don't say Vilnius, that's how it's in Lithuanian. Jews say Vilna, right? It was known as the Jerusalem of the, uh, of the East, right? A great, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of chokhmis, a lot of wisdom there. Um, and so it was established in 1925 and a repository of anything doing with Yiddish culture, music, poetry, cookbooks, grammar, records, or, I mean, in terms of recordings of music, um, uh, uh, paintings, anything that, that was a reflection of East European Yiddish culture. And of course, uh, when the war came, they quickly had to gather up the boxes. Some stuff, sadly, was lost to the Germans, but they were able to get the majority of the material out in 1940, establish themselves up on the Upper East Side, just off of Fifth Avenue and 86th Street, um, which I used to study at. It used to be the former Amy Vanderbilt Mansion. Today, if you go there, it's the very famous, I, I think they call it the Noya... It's a, it's a museum of, of, of Austrian-German art started by uh, Ronald Lauder. And if you're interested in more about Yiddish culture, the YIVO Institute is downtown on uh, 16th and 17th uh, Street between uh, 7th and 6th Avenues. Um, okay, so let me just, oh, real quick, and then I'll get to some, a little bit of theater and a little bit more about music. Um, no, uh, Yale. Yeah, we would uh -huh. love to hear some music too. Well, Everybody's kind of excited about are they ready? You on okay. your violin. So let me just tell you this. So a lot of people think. So when the Soviet Union came in in, in 1917, um, uh, you know, communist government overthrew a lot of Yiddish-speaking Jews fought for it. We're happy for it. A lot of artists like Chagall, like Mark Chagall, by the way, Moshe was his name. Um, uh, who who uh, worked uh, in the Yiddish theater there? So they had Yiddish theater. So actually, Yiddish theater, music, literature, poetry was really promoted by the Soviet Union uh, from the early 20s through the mid 30s until by 37, unfortunately, Stalin, the disease of paranoia came again in his mind. He saw a Jew under every leaf, 
And so we got to get rid of the Jews, got to get rid of Jewish culture. And sadly, that was the demise of Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union. But there was a lot of great culture that we, we still have from those days. In fact, if you're interested in some of those Yiddish songs, I did a recording. You can find it on my website, yalestrom.com. It's called City of the Future. These Yiddish poet, uh, poem songs for children that we put to, to music. Um, okay, so now music. I know a lot of you have been waiting. For so I'll give you a little bit about the, about the history, a little bit of the language. Because the music... You have to have a language because if you're singing Yiddish, it's language, right? There's instrumental tunes, Yiddish. So let me get my violin. So the Yiddish word uh, for the Jewish music uh, that I play is klezmer, but it's really a Hebrew word, right? It's clay zemer. Clay, kaf lamed yud means tools, kaleen. Kaleen means utensils, like a fork or a knife. Zemer. Zion Mem Reish, Zemmer, right? Zemirot, Zemmer, Zemmer. Sing melodies, lots of that the root Zemmer, melodies, songs. So what is my violin? What the uh, tool of the music and the pronunciation is Klesmer. So, all right, I'll play you a melody and we'll talk a little bit about um, this aspect of Yiddish culture that came to be and that we love it so much throughout the world today. So I'll play something. <laughs> So thank you. So that, that was a melody that actually comes from the country today, uh, Belarus. It was Poland once, right? When my baba, it was from Belarus, it was there. It was Poland, that's why she spoke Polish as well as Yiddish and um, a, little, uh, a little Ukrainian actually more than uh, the Belarus. And it was known as a nigun. Nigun is the Yiddish pronunciation of the Hebrew, nigun, right? Melody. Um, many Hasidim, brought this aspect, the, the, the Hasidic culture, I should say, when, when ha Hasidus, the philosophy of Hasidus, which is imbued with a lot of Kabbalah, right? Kabbalah, welcoming us. Uh, how do we say Kabbalah in Yiddish? We don't say uh, Kabbalah. Kabbalah, as we like in, in Hebrew, we say Kabula. In Yiddish, it's Kabula. And the Hasidim, coming from the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, right? Rabbi Israel Eliezer. Born 1700, died around 1760. And I can give you a whole simple, a whole another big lecture on, on the history of Hasidim, but I'll, I'm going to just give you like the really one minute, two minute version. Basically, the Jews coming out of that period in the mid 18th century had, had, had come on, on had um, survived some great difficulties, the grandchildren. What happened in the mid 17th century, 1600s, 
lots of pogroms, including one of the biggest, the Chelmnitsky pogroms, where over perhaps we think as much as 250,000 Jews were murdered. And so basically rabbis, there was this kind of rabbinic Judaism, it's called rabbinic, coming out of Lithuania, meaning study is important, Talmud, Torah, following every mitzvah, you know, dotting every I and crossing every T. Every but if you're poor, you're tired, you don't have the head, you don't have that head, the interest for Talmud and Torah as much, whatever, um, it's impossible to follow that. And, and so there was, it was quite strict. There were a lot of Jews who just were unhappy. Let's put it that way. There was sort of a cloud, a, a grayness over much of the population. When the Baal Shem Tov comes around, when the, when the Baal Shem Tov comes around, um, he realizes when he would take his walks in the Carpathian Mountains, he loved nature, he wanted to be near nature, and he realizes he has a dream. And he realizes God doesn't want his people, his children to be sad all the time. It's about happiness. Yes, there's, we have sadness and, and things to be sad, but really it's joy that overcomes this. And if you want to celebrate me, Hashem, God is saying, don't celebrate it through being so tough and strict. In other words, don't do a mitzvah just because I told you to, right? In other words, don't keep the mitzvah just because, oh, that's another check mark in the good, in the good column for me in heaven. No, one does a mitzvah out of just doing it, out of the heart, right? Because you want to, it's good, right? It's like, it's like when you give a gift, you're giving a gift to somebody because you love them and you feel good about it. You're not giving him a gift saying, oh, I'm giving him a gift because guess what? He's going to give me a gift back. No. And that's the, the thing about a mitzvah, the mitzvahs. So the Baal Shem Tov turned that on his head. He says, the way to connect with God is not through, only through study, but it's through prayer and song. And that's the key. And then, while this was revolutionary, because every Jew, even the ones who weren't Talmud Chachams, the poor Jews, the poor, the Jews who who couldn't afford to stay up late at night because they had to work 12, 14 hours to make a, li a living, you know, for Dinta Bissel Parnosa, you know, they had to make Parnosa, right? In Hebrew, Parnasa, Parnasa, the Yiddish Parnosa, Parnosa, right? Uh, a living earning. Um, he says, you can do it through singing and prayer. And yes, study's still important in Talmud. If you, when you have the time and capability, please study Torah and Talmud. It's, it's a good mitzvah. But if you want to connect and do something right away that brings joy to you and joy to Hashem, God, then it's through music and through singing. And, and why am I mentioning this with Klezmer? Because this created a whole new repertoire for the Jewish music content, for the Yiddish music content, we say in Jewish, right? For the Jewish musicians. So now they're playing other kinds of melodies. All right, let me play another song for you here. Um, I'll play you a, 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 a melody from Romania that the Klezmer would play. They didn't create it, they didn't compose it. It actually comes from Romanian folk music, but they created it and it ends up becoming their own. It goes like this. I'll take my glasses off, I don't need to see on this. Thank <laughs> you. 
So you hear, thank you. So, and so you might say, what's the rhythm? So this rhythm, this. Those who are musical out there can feel it as a waltz, right? One, two, three, two, two, three. It's actually written in a very slow three over eight, three, eight. So that's many, you hear many, if you go to Romania, you hear many uh, folk music uh, tunes like that. Um, and so, um, I want to, let me see how we're doing with time. Uh, oh, okay. So let me, 10 minutes. I'm going to wrap things up a little bit and leave it up for some questions. So when Jerry asked me about this, say, okay, speak about Yiddish culture, you know, and so I'm giving you some about the language and the music for, um, um, World War II, nine out of every, 10 Jews in Eastern Europe was sadly murdered. Western Europe, six out of every two is sadly murdered. So we lost this huge population of Jews in really a good chunk of our culture, Yiddish speaking. And so for many years, um, uh, for many years, I just wanna get my note here. Uh, People are saying, oh, it's dying, the language is dying, and Yiddish culture is dying, and, and what do we have? We're just gonna have delis and so forth and so on. But interestingly enough, there has been a revival of Yiddish culture, not just the language, language, music, uh, theater, some of those, and, and, and where do we see this, and how did it come about? Well, one reason is, um, Starting in the 1970s, in the United States, uh, I believe it was about 74, 75, 73, something like that, there was that really famous television program called Roots, right? Roots. And it's about, sadly, about the African-American experience starting literally the, from West Africa and they were taking as slaves and all the way up through Reconstruction period. And it was the most watched show, show in television, a book, you know, New York Times bestseller, and so what we call today, anthropologists, we call the root syndrome, meaning other people started to say, other minorities, other cultures in America say, well, wait a minute, what about my culture? Yes, I'm American, you know, I speak English and I, you know, I drive a Chevrolet and I eat apple pie, <laughs> but I'm also Irish, I'm also Scottish, I'm also Jewish, I'm also East European Jew. And so when the, Revival of Klezmer began in the mid 1970s. Some people, older Jews, said, oh yes, I know it. It's it's Freilax. They didn't call it Klezmer. We call it Freilax, but they call it dance music, dance music, or they just would call it Hasana music, wedding music, or they would say Simcha, simcha music, Simcha celebration music. Um, but what really caught fire was it started getting the interest started growing with the youth, right? Not that people in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, but people in their teens, 20s, and 30s. And so thus begins this, quote, revival of, of this Yiddish culture, this piece of it, the music, instrumental music, and, of course, with klezmer, instrumental dances, you also have the language, right? Because you hear people singing Yiddish. That's the poetry, the songs. And, and then slowly, slowly, synagogues, JCCs, etc. You know, in the 1960s, if there was a JCC in Irvine, I don't know when this was built, but let's say there was, you wouldn't have a Klezmer band in 1965. Klezmer, forget about it, it's old, we don't want to hear from it. Play Latin music, play rock music, whatever, play Israeli music. Today, now when you say the word Klezmer, oh, of course I know Klezmer, I have CDs or records and I've been to so many bands, but the first five, six, ten years of it was like, whoa, klezmer. And you even see that in Central and Eastern Europe, where klezmer became very hip. It was almost contraculture. So when I was traveling in Eastern Europe, I would find many Polish people, not Jews, some Jews, but young 
who were against the regimes in Romania and Poland and Hungary, Czechoslovakia. And they loved hearing Klezmer. First it was Jewish, so it was like against the government because you know the hegemony of the Soviet Union was anti-Semitic. So anything that was against the Soviet Union, a lot of them liked. And also they're hearing some melodies and saying, wait a minute, that's Jewish, but I think my grandmother used to sing something like that. Or, you know, and I heard an old record like that. Meaning these people realize that when you lose 6 million people, it takes a hole out of the culture, right? And it's not easily mended. And starting in the 1980s, you start seeing young Jews in Eastern Europe, as well as in America, getting curious about this culture that was their grandparents, a culture that was known only for sadness because it was a Yiddish culture that was about death and et cetera. And so Klezmer helped bring this revival. And the revival has gone today. There, there, is it ever going to be as great as it once was? No, it's sadly, you need numbers. But there is a small core of secular Jews learning Yiddish. Not, I, I should say that, excuse me, a lot of non-Jews learning. You don't have to be Jewish to, you know, what was the saying? What was the, what was the advertisement on the buses of New York City? You don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's rye bread. Right, and it was a Native American eating a kosher rye bread. So, um, and we see this in theater. And so Yiddish is a part of the American pop culture. That's a whole nother lecture. Television, I didn't even talk about television today. Theater, right? Without Yiddish musical theater, there would be no Broadway musical theater. You can't get any more influential than that. And it was Yiddish musical theater. It wasn't English, Irish, Welsh, German. Yiddish. Molly, Molly Pecan. Molly Pecan is, and many other greats. Aaron Lebedev, you said it. Exactly. So anyhow, the Yiddish that once was, it's changing, it's different. I mean, you're, now you're getting uh, movies on Netflix and others that are all in Yiddish. And they're not necessarily only about uh, religious uh, life. It, uh, it's about other aspects of life. So. The Yiddish is here, it's growing in fits and spurts, and, um, and it's a very, and, and the language and the culture um, hopefully has a long future. And of course, I've been doing my own part in terms of music, of recording, of writing about it, and books, and so forth and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm open to, to take some questions from some people, and then I'll yeah, finish I, up. I would like to, if people could send your question through the chat, and I'll just read it off. So we have about five or 10 minutes left for questions. Um, so Yivo has a bunch of free online courses on Yiddish theater, cuisine, folklore. Um, yes, that's a thank you for that. And history. It's, right, They're yes. very it's worthwhile. That's from Deborah Glazer. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, I was, a, if I may say, I was a fellow twice at Yivo doing research there. And yes, it's a great repository. And of course, they're doing so much via Zoom. Uh, these days, uh, as we slowly um, try get rid of this uh, virus, as you would say it in Yiddish. Instead of virus, they say virus. Um, so thank you for that. Yes, YIVO. As other, I'm, I'm actually going to give a plug to a Yiddish organization that was started three years ago here in San Diego. And we're doing things that are all over the world. So folks, I'm going to spell it out for you slowly because we're actually going to be doing a major event next week with Yiddishists, artists, singers, uh, writers from around the world, and you can get all the information at Y A A A N A dot org. Y A A A N A dot O R G. Go to that Yana dot org, and you can you can take classes. You can you can you participate, and it's a new organization started by this wonderful Polish woman who. And her own backstory is interesting how she came into Yiddish culture. And she's a PhD, PhD student getting her PhD in, in Yiddish. And I'm on the board. But anyway, yaaana.org is another great place for Yiddish cultural activities. We have another question from Francine Morrison. Can you tell us again, where is YIVO? YIVO is in New York City. It's um, 16th Street between 7th and 6th Avenues. It, it is in the building called the Jewish, um, is it called the Jewish, build, uh, Jewish Historical Building? It, it's in the building that houses the Leo Beck Center, that's German for German Jews, YIVO. It, it houses the Sephardic House, Sephardic culture, 
and I'm missing, I'm thinking one more. So it's all under this big roof and they have many floors and exhibits and you can go there just to do research. You don't have to uh, be enrolled in any class. You can just be a person off the street and show interest. I have a request before we end because I don't see any more questions. Mm -hmm. Could we hear one more piece to end? Yes. One more of your wonderful violin pieces to sure. end this session. Yes. And Thank so I would, I'd like to say a couple of things before I say goodbye. And of course, I uh -huh. Jerry and everybody. So everybody listening. Um, I was going to be leading, obviously, not now. I, I just want to let you know if you're interested, I was going to be leading a tour a Jewish tour, particularly with the music side of things, to Romania and Moldova, but we moved it to next year. It was going to be this fall, but obvious reasons. And it's going to be uh, done by Ayelet, A-Y-E-L-E-T dot com. Ayelet. They lead many tours to Israel around the world. So if you're interested, you can write me. And how do you reach me? It's just my website is Yale Strom, Y-A-L-E-S-T-R-O-M dot com. And, uh, and please support us artists, uh, academicians. That's how we, li we live and support ourselves from this. So here's a melody. Okay. Uh, let's see which, uh, what should I do here? Um, uh, I'll do a very simple upbeat niggin. Let's see. Uh, uh. A ganz yo frila, a ganz yo frila, a ganz yo frila, a frila zoman a ganz yo frila, a ganz yo frila, a ganz yo frila, a frila zoman zain. Ho! What do we say? I say you can, one could say Zygazunt or Zygazint, right? Zygazunt. Yeah, I, I, I say the Galician or Romanish, all my oohs have become e's. Instead of saying shul, I say shiel, a git shabbos. So Zygazint and Vashti hent, if you want to, right? Which means wash your hands. Svey mol, dry moles, two times or three times, whatever is best for you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Thanks, Jerry. We really appreciate you. We really enjoyed it. We learned a lot and enjoyed hearing from you. Thank you. I'm going to just unmute everybody. They can find the spot to do that. And, and if anybody, would, you're all unmuted. If anybody would like to make a quick comment or something, you are welcome to. Hello? <laughs> oh, listen to all the noise. <laughs> if anybody likes to speak, I say anything. Hello, everybody. Let me see. Did you enjoy it? Give me a thumbs up so I can see it. He's talking yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm asking if we liked it. Yes, I was asking if you liked it. I'm asking you, did you learn at least one new piece of information? Oh. <laughs> yeah, we learned a lot. Oh, that's good. That's always nice to know. I sent you a question just now about a song that I'm wondering if it's Sephardic. And uh -huh. I hope you'll have the time to look it up on YouTube and send me an answer. Yeah, if you can, you can you send it to my email, which you'll find on my website. That will make it easiest for me, so I don't have to write anything right now. Okay. How about how many uh, Yiddish words are now incorporated into the English language, yes. mostly through the Jewish comics? 
Right, right, very much so. That's it. Well, it's like it's like all cultures, um, you know, Spanish and French. So why not Yiddish? And of course, um, many reasons why, but particularly because of work re work related, and especially in the entertainment field, as more and more people were using it in writing and humor, and um, because Yiddish is very descriptive. That's it. We have, you know, as they say, the the Aleuts, the indigenous people of the north, above the Arctic Circle would say um, they have 72 ways to describe snow. We're, we're us dummies. We say, snow, it's cold, it's a bizzle cold, it's a little hard, it's a little soft. And they say, what? What are you, Nika boobs? Yeah, three words, soft, hard, and slushy for snow. We got 72 words. Why? Because that's their life. So it says something about Jews. Well, what is our life? We're very, very people and interior oriented, right? And so we have many, many, many descriptions of people, adjectives of describing someone, you know? You didn't just say, oh, here comes this handsome man. You could say that. But look at all the words. The guy's a schmo. The guy's a schlemiel. The, the guy's a schlamazel. The guy's a schmendrick. God forbid, if he's a schmo and a schmendrick and a schlamazel and a schlemiel, all, this, all at the same time, right? If, you're, if your daughter came in the house and said, meet my husband-to-be, his name is Moshe Schmendrick, you'd say, come on, you're putting me on. His name is Moshe Schmendrick? Come on. Where did you find this character? And you see, so, and, and you know why, folks? That, that's a whole nother lecture. But because we always were at the behest of the governing people over us, whether it was the Tsar, whether it was the Austro-Hungarians, well, there was the Germans, and and there were good times for us, right? We agreed, but there were a lot of bad times for us. And so when you don't have the power of the fist, the gun, what do you have the power? You have the power of the moyach, the brain, and meaning you can, you, you can, you can undress somebody with quick wit, with a good joke. And, and so that there's historically, that's why Jews went into the business of humor and comedy because we can undress you could beat somebody up they, uh, first, they, uh, they laughing at themselves they didn't realize it and of course the best example of course of being a talmud chacham with with quick wit is who groucho marx yes yes right right yes so that's it so right. again that's it's interesting right. anybody else okay. we say our zygots Yes, I hear you, Karen. Okay, I didn't know you heard me. I, I just sent you a chat, and when I was on the iPhone class this afternoon, immediately I sent you one, I sent Cheryl one, and I sent the speaker one saying I was having problems, and nobody paid attention, so I just finally left the class. Oh, you know what? I never got anything from you because I would have answered right away. As you know, I always do. So for some reason, I didn't get anything from it you. It was through the chat that you, you know, when you go into participant and you yeah. press your name and do the chat. Yeah, I didn't get anything because I would have answered you, certainly. Okay, because really if it sorry. happens But again, come tomorrow. I'll send you the link. Try signing up for tomorrow. No, I was linked in. That wasn't my problem. My problem was my phone had different said different things than he was talking about. Oh, so yes. I tried to ask okay. him a question about, wait a minute, my phone doesn't have HD. My phone doesn't have that. What do I okay. have? You know what? Let's, first thing tomorrow, we'll get on early and you can ask him those questions, okay? Okay, fine. That sounds good. Okay, okay. so just get on early. We're all gonna be early tomorrow. Okay. And I wanna thank the rest of you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you, let's see, oh, tomorrow night's a movie. Well, the movie and then the director of the movie and, or the producer is going to be speaking about it. I saw this movie, if you haven't seen it, it is a beautiful movie, very touching, uh, called Dolphin Boy. And uh, you've probably seen emails go out about it. So you can, yes, Louise, what? Will we be notified of this? Um, I can send you the link. Oh, okay. it, it should have come to you in an email a couple of times, but I can certainly send you the link, Louise. I'll get yeah. your email. Oh, send it to me as well, please. Who's that? Sophia. Sophia? Okay, so uh, it's Louise Sussman, right? Yes. 
Okay, I'm writing this down and Sophia. Okay, I'll just send it to you tonight. So when, and when then you can shown, is it being shown at a certain time? No, you can watch it at any time. Oh. After you sign up, you'll get the link. Okay. And then the, the producer, uh, I think it's the producer you know or the director uh, will be um, speaking at seven o'clock to discuss the film. So as a matter of fact, Lerone might know this or Julie might know this exactly whether he was the uh, producer or um, director. Um, I'm not sure, but it, it's, his name is Danny Menken. He's done a lot of amazing um, Israeli films and this is another one. And Are there I just, I really enjoy it. It is subtitles, yes. That's good, yes. I like it, thank you. Yes, okay. okay. All right, so you come on early tomorrow, uh, Karen, and we'll get your question solved. And uh, thank you everybody else. Thank you. For uh, joining in. Okay, bye. You have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye.